Hey, what's going on? It's Brian Goulet of the Goulet Pen Company, and I'm here for another episode of Goulet Q&A. This is episode 22, and it's an open forum this week, so I'm taking all kinds of random questions. I do want to apologize for missing last week. I was originally planning to do this on, what was it, February 14th on Valentine's Day. Ended up not being able to do it uh, because we had a snow day here. We don't get a lot of snow in Virginia, but we got, you know, six inches, which for central Virginia pretty much shuts everything down. We decided to close our office so that we would keep everybody safe and not have everybody slipping and sliding all over the road. Uh, and then the following day, we were, uh, Rachel and I were going to go out of town and visit her parents. So we ended up not having the last two days of the week last week. So that's why I had to kind of postpone it, but that's okay. It worked out. You know, we, we got caught up with everything with the snow and all that stuff, but um, that's why there was no Q&A. So I apologize. You know, I try not to do that. I try not to, you know, commit to doing a Q&A and then miss out on it. If I am going to be skipping one, I try to announce it ahead of time. But that just didn't work out last week. So here I am now doing the open forum. So got lots of good questions too. Um, it was kind of fun though. We did get to go up to Rachel's parents. They live in Northern Virginia. And um, you know, it's a little bit colder there and a little more hilly. You know, it's pretty flat here in, in just outside of Richmond, Virginia. Um, so our kids don't really have any place to go sledding. Um, and it's not often we get snow to even be able to go sledding. But you know, our son's four, daughter's two. So we went up to her parents and we were able to have them sled for the first time in their life. It was pretty cool. Took tons of video and pictures, um, and my son was quoted as saying that it was that sledding on the hill was the most fun thing he'd ever done. That's what he said. So I guess it was worth it. Anyway, okay, lots of good questions. I'm gonna plow through because there are all kinds of good random good stuff. Um, I'll start off with Ravis on Ink Nouveau. You said. In your Fountain Pen 101 videos, you discuss the differences between ballpoint pens, gel rollerball pens, and fountain pens. What's the difference between a gel rollerball pen and the refillable rollerball pens, like the Noodler's Nib Creeper, the Jerobon refillable rollerball, etc.? Do they function the same? Uh, yes and no. Okay, so gel rollerballs, they're using a disposable cartridge that you remove out of the pen. Or it might be, you know, I'm thinking like the, the Pilot Precise is a, roll, a rollerball pen that's filled with ink and it just, um, you know, it's disposable essentially. So that's that's basically what you're dealing with. The, the true gel rollerballs are using a, a gel-based ink, so it's thicker than fountain pen ink. Um, it writes smoothly, um, but it's in that cartridge and once it's done, you throw it out and you get a new one. So um, you know, uh, they're, go they're gonna write smoothly, they're gonna write pretty bold, there's gonna be no shading and stuff. You're gonna have limited color options as opposed to, you know, fountain pens where you get 500 colors uh, or more. And um, it's gonna run out, you know, not as quickly as a fountain pen would, but you know, a cartridge, you're gonna pay anywhere between two and $10 for a, a gel rollerball cartridge, depending on the brand of pen you're using. And it, uh, it may only last you a month or two if you're writing with it, you know, pretty regularly. So, you know, over time, that's gonna add up quite a bit, um, whereas a bottle of fountain pen ink will last you years, pretty much. Um, so there is some economy involved in there. Also, the gel rollerball, um, as opposed to the other ones, you know, depending on the quality of the rollerball and stuff, one may feel scratchier, one may feel better. It's that's really going to depend both on the rollerball and on uh, on the gel rollerball and on the refillable rollerball. But the refillable rollerball is essentially acting like a fountain pen. It's got a feed system and everything. It uses the same fountain pen ink that a fountain pen does, as opposed to using a thicker gel ink like you get in those cartridges in a gel rollerball pen. Um, however, your options are pretty limited for types of pens that take that fountain pen ink in a rollerball form. So, you know, you got you mentioned the Noodles one, the Jerobon one, there's the Monteverde One Touch and Gage, that's another one. Um, there's a couple other brands, I think Visconti is the Eco Roller, uh, there, there might be some other ones out there, but there's not a lot. There's maybe a handful of refillable rollerballs out there. And um, you still get, <laughs> You get some of the benefit of the rollerball, but you also get some of the drawbacks of fountain pens, like you know refilling it and uh, getting ink on your fingers and stuff like that. So you know it is kind of a trade-off for me. It's like there are, there is some utility to it. Honestly, though, I prefer to use just a real fountain pen. I don't find the trade-off to be all that great, but you know for some people it does work out really well. The thing that really does help is if you're writing um, anywhere you need to pro provide a lot of pressure. So if you're doing like carbon copies and you need to push through multiple sheets of paper that's where it can really help. A conventional fountain pen may or may not do that well for you. So hopefully that helps close it up for you anyway. Uh, and then you had a second question. Uh, what about refillable, ro refillable marker pens like the Platinum, Platinum Preppy marker pen or the highlighter pen? How do those work with swapping colors? 
I imagine the marker tip would retain any old ink colors for a while or for quite a long time and make lots of unpleasant browns. So yeah, you're definitely right. I forgot to flip my little guy there. Uh, you're definitely right. So. Um, when it comes to these refillable markers and highlighters and stuff, you've got like a felt wick kind of thing that's, that's acting as the tip. Um, you're still using the same kind of liquid ink that you would in a fountain pen or, you know, usually you're, you're wanting to use like a highlighter ink or something if you're using it as an actual highlighter. Um, you can also use like the Noodler's um, water erase inks if you want to use it as a dry erase marker. Uh, generally though, with that wick type of feed that you've got on those pens, you don't want to swap colors very often. It's a pain. You're right. You usually can't clean the color out that great, especially if you're going from a really dark color to a light color. Yeah, it's just not going to clean that great, you know, because of, because of the nature of that wick thing. Now you can replace those tips, so that's an option. If you're going to really drastic colors, you can just replace the tip. Uh, or what you can do is you can try cleaning the tip, you know, soaking it in a solution of water with maybe 10% bleach in there um, to try to help with that. Soak it overnight, something, and then clean it with water to see how it goes after that. That might be hit or miss depending on the ink you're using, um, but that is, that is an option for you there. All right, Ryan G on Facebook said, if someone were interested in getting a current non-vintage pen with a soft gold nib and good to moderate flex, what would, be, what would some of the best options be? And there were a bunch of likes on this question on Facebook, so I figured that it was on a bunch of people's minds. So um, I'm only gonna stick to the ones that I know. I know there's other ones out there, but the ones that I'm familiar with, um, the Falcon, uh, the Namiki Falcon, the Pilot Falcon. Namiki and Pilot are kind of the same brand. They're going through a transition right now with the name change. They're going from Namiki to Pilot Fine Writing. So you may see the Falcon come up under both Namiki and Pilot's names. Similar pen though. Um, so that's got a soft gold nib with a good amount of flex, good amount of variation. I've got several videos on the Falcon. Go check those out. Um, the, the Pilot Metal Falcon is another one. Same nib, different body of the pen. Um, Platinum has a couple. So they've got a soft fine nib on some of their 3776 models of pens. Um, not quite as much variation in flexibility on those as there is on the Falcon, but there is still some variation. That one goes from like a fine to a medium. You know, a little bit of variation there, but it is really springy, kind of soft, and gets some flexibility there. Um, the Platinum Modern Machier and the Kanazawa Leaf Machier, um, and for that matter, the nib design is similar on the Platinum Cool as it is on those two pens, but that's a steel nib, it's not a gold nib, but it is still got a little bit of flexibility to it. So those ones do have some flexibility as well. Uh, the Pelican M1000, I haven't ridden with that pen before until we started special ordering those uh, a couple of weeks ago. And man, let me tell you, that nib is sweet. <laughs> it's a giant nib. I think it's a number 10 nib. It's really huge. And uh, it's, uh, it's definitely got some softness to it. Look at the writing samples. You know, go on the nib nook. If you've never heard of the nib nook, go to gulepens.com, click on the nib nook. Uh, icon the tab up there and you'll see that that's kind of a cool tool that I've done writing samples with every pen every nib that we that we carry um, and you can see which ones have some flexibility to them and usually if it's a gold nib I'll write 14k or 18k just to kind of distinguish that um, and then the other option I would say is to get something custom ground. That's really going to be where you're going to be able to get exactly what you want. Now it's going to be expensive. I know custom grinding for flexibility, you're looking over $100 easily um, in addition to the cost of the pen. So it's very expensive to go that route, but then you can get it done on, on maybe some other pens that wouldn't normally be offered. Uh, David on Ink Nouveau said, why doesn't Lamy make black nibs in 1.1, 1.5, and 1.9 millimeter stubs? A bare steel, steel nib just looks out of place on my charcoal black safari. I hear ya. I get asked about this all the time. Why doesn't Lamy offer the stub nibs with uh, black coating? So uh, basically, if you're not familiar, Lamy has an extra fine through broad and then a 1.1, 1.5, 1.9 millimeter stub. Uh, and they only offer the extra fine through broad in both the steel and the black coloring. It's the same nib, it's just got a black coating on it to make it look black. It does look really cool with some of the pens though, especially that charcoal safari like you're talking about here, David. So I hear where you're coming from. I honestly don't know. I do pass that feedback up to them uh, and I'm actually gonna be meeting with somebody from Lamy uh, later this afternoon. So I will pass that feedback up. I, you know, I can't guarantee it's gonna do anything. I do believe that there is adequate demand for uh, black stubs. It, it could have something to do with the way that it might affect the flow or something. I don't know if they've ever tried it. Honestly, I'm kind of detached from Lamy in Germany, so I don't know 
that that they've ever experimented with that or even thought about it or whatever. But I will pass up my feedback, but I don't, I don't know if anything will come of it. Um, so there you go. Rebecca S. in an email said, I know you don't carry ballpoints, but do you have a favorite ballpoint? <laughs> Uh, so I don't know if I'm going to be considered, you know, a heretic for saying that I even use a ballpoint, but there are rare occasions when a ballpoint may be acceptable. Um, there are certain situations around the office here where we might use a ballpoint, you know, for writing on cardboard or something like that. You know, generally we try to use fountain pens around here all the time, but in a warehouse type situation, a, a ballpoint is sometimes, not even a ballpoint, it's a gel rollerball really, um, but, but uh, we like the Pilot G2s, you know, they're just like a great all around kind of banger on pen, you know, especially in a warehouse environment where you drop, maybe dropping it all the time and stuff like that. It is kind of handy just kind of toss those around. So, and we carry Pilot and we like, we like their stuff. Um, but if you're talking about an actual ballpoint, there's really only one ballpoint that I use and it's very, very rare. Um, let me grab it for you real quick. It's, uh, it's actually one that we used to sell. So that's why I'm thinking it's not total heresy to be talking about this, but um, it's the Carandosh. Uh, ballpoint. This one is technically the Metal X uh, in blue, which I I like this shade of blue. It's kind of my thing. It's my shirt color for today. Uh, and, you know, our logo on our website and everything. And the cool thing about this, it's um, the click mechanism in this thing is just really smooth, just really smooth. And the ballpoint in here, it's really high capacity ink. Um, it's a paste ink, just like other ballpoints, but it's a really smooth ballpoint. So it's a more expensive ballpoint pen for, for what it is. Um, but Karandash's stuff is really high quality, really well made. And this particular type of ballpoint just writes smoother than any other ballpoint I've ever written with. So we used to carry this like three years ago or something. We dipped our toes in the water with ballpoints. It did okay, but we didn't do that great with it. So we eventually discontinued them. Um, you know, I'd be open to carrying these again. If there really is demand for these, I, I would because, you know, I really like this particular pen. But at this point, we're so deep into fountain pens, I don't know that we could carry any ballpoints without alienating a certain uh, base of our following. <laughs> so I don't know, we'd be open to it, but. Okay, and then Rebecca, you had another question, uh, kind of on a different vein. Uh, they said, what are your thoughts on the platinum carbon black ink and its use in pens other than the Noodler's Flex? Uh, by all means, you know, go for it. The platinum carbon black, it's a pigmented ink. So it's, n it's not your typical dye-based liquid fountain pen ink. Um, it's still pretty fluid, so it's got pigments. So it's actually got, you know, finely ground pigment that's uh, suspended in the ink. Um, some advantages of that is that it's really water resistant. Um, if you put it down on the page and you you know want to do any type of ink washing or um, you want it to be really kind of waterproof for for you know addressing envelopes and stuff like that, works really well. Also, because of the nature of that pigment, instead of the dye, dye-based inks need to kind of soak into the paper to be able to kind of attain any kind of permanence. Uh, these pigmented inks, though, don't necessarily need to do that. They dry more on the top of the page. So if you have really heavily sized paper, like watercolor paper or certain types of envelopes and stuff like that that might be really coated, um, it will dry much better on those, even some postcards and stuff. If it's really coated, like shiny photo paper type stuff, it's, it's probably not going to help you that much there. But if it's got, you know, a really kind of slick, heavy coating on it and normal fountain pen ink is not working so great on it, the pigmented inks will do better on those. Um, so my, my thing is, you know, I'll always give a warning though. Whenever you're using pigmented inks, you got to make sure that you're keeping it clean. You're not letting it dry out in the pen. So you got you to gotta use caution whenever you're using those. You know, the Noodler's inks and, and the Noodler's pens in particular have a really wide open feed. You can easily disassemble them. So if it does kind of dry up in there, you can clean it out easier than some other pens. So just be aware of what pen you're using and how comfortable you're cleaning it out, how quickly the ink dries up in there if it's like right now here it's winter time the air is really dry because we got you know heaters running all the time so be conscious of that when you're using any kind of pigmented ink all right tracy l on facebook said what's the difference between noodler's blue ghost and whiteness of the whale okay i get this question a lot too so i'm actually kind of glad you asked this uh blue ghost and whiteness of the whale they appear to have similar properties they're actually very different inks um, some of the similarities they have they're both bulletproof and they both are UV reactive. So if you shine them under a black light, they will glow. Um, not the most super practical purpose for your everyday fountain pen ink. Um, and the bulletproof aspect too is kind of interesting because, well, Blue Ghost is an invisible ink. So how much does it matter if you can see an invisible ink 
after it gets wet or whatever. But you know, I think what's cool about that is if you want to, um, you know, write any secret messages or anything like that. You know, Blue Ghost is really cool because it's a completely invisible ink. You cannot see it on the page unless you shine a black light under it. That's the point of it. Um, the whiteness of the whale is a little different. It's got the similar properties, which is why it gets confused with Blue Ghost. Um, but it's in a much smaller bottle, and it's more expensive. Uh, and it's kind of a white. It's kind of a white ink. It's not a pure white, though. So if you put it on paper, you know, if you, you can't really put it on black paper and expect it to pop. It's really kind of like a milky white, like a really watered down skim milk kind of color. So it's not really going to be. It's not like writing with white out on the page. You know, like some people are, are hoping. I do get asked from time to time. Is there a white fountain pen ink that I can use on dark paper? No, there is not, and it doesn't exist. Because in order to get that kind of bright whiteness like you have with whiteout, you need to use pigments, and that would cause problems in fountain pen ink. Um, so you can you can get white ink with like dip calligraphy inks, which is much thicker, and you can use pigments, but that kind of stuff won't flow through a fountain pen feed. Um, so whiteness of the whale is not used for that purpose. What whiteness of the whale is for is to mix with other inks to lighten up their color. So if you have a really dark blue and you want to lighten it up to a lighter blue, you mix some whiteness of the whale in there, it'll make it lighter. It won't desaturate it totally like if you use uh, just pure water, but it'll lighten up the color. If you have a red and you want to make it a pink, you can use that whiteness of the whale. That's what it's for. And then the bulletproof and UV reactive properties are just kind of something additionally to it. Um, either of those inks too, if you mix it with other inks, you know, you could kind of use that, I guess, if you wanted to have you know, to kind of guarantee like your own signature. If you use an ink and you mix a little blue ghost in it, then when you write with it, you can have a little bit of that UV reactivity. Obviously, the more blue ghost you add, the more UV reactivity you'd have. It can be a way to kind of have a secret signature. Or one of the coolest things that I ever heard about um, was a couple that was engaged, and they were um, one of the 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 May, male guy, fiance, was a soldier overseas. And uh, his fiance would write him a letter, and in the, um, the, I'll call it the more personal portions of the letter, she would write it in blue ghost, so that when his buddies would grab the letter, it would seem pretty inconspicuous, but then he would know to look at the part she'd written in blue ghost for the more personal parts, so his buddies wouldn't hassle him too much about you know, what his, his girl was writing to him. So I thought that was kind of a cool, cool little story about how to use that ink. Uh, Bianca M on Facebook said, my everyday use pens for writing are both by Waterman, Aphilius and a Couture. Uh, have you considered adding Waterman pens to your mid-priced pen lines? Um, I have considered it, except uh, the Phileas was discontinued years ago, and it appears that the Culture was also discontinued a while ago. I'm not as familiar with that pen, but I do get asked about the Phileas quite a bit. Those are both less expensive pens, like $20, $30 pens. Uh, now, if you try to buy them, they're like 100 bucks because, you know, well, the Culture I found more, but the Phileas has is, is gone up quite a bit in price since it was discontinued. Um, it was a shame because they were less expensive pens. So now, like the least expensive Waterman they have, I think, is the Hemisphere, which is around sixty or seventy dollars, and that's that's a pretty expensive entry level pen. Um, Waterman's got a lot of nicer stuff that's way more expensive. Um, I have considered carrying some Waterman stuff. Honestly, a lot of it is I haven't had a lot of people asking me about it, um, and it appears to be available in a lot of different places because Waterman is such an old brand. It's very well known. You can get them at a lot of office supply stores and larger places that may not really know anything about fountain pens, but they offer the pens anyway. So, you know, as a boutique fountain pen store like I have. Carrying something as ubiquitous as a Waterman may or may not do as well for me, and I don't. I haven't had a lot of people asking me about it, so uh, I'm open to it, but you know, cautiously. Uh, Phil K, in your email, you said, uh, interesting question here. I've never been asked this before, but uh, when at the post office, they always ask if you're shipping liquids, among many other things. If that answer is yes, in fact, I'm shipping three ounces of ink. What then? Are there precautions that need to be taken to ship ink via the USPS, or does it just need to be declared? 
Uh, and I would think that I'm an appropriate one to ask because uh, at GoulayPens.com, at this point in time, we're shipping exclusively on the U.S. Postal Service. So uh, any ink you're buying is coming USPS. So you would think that we would know something about that. Um, honestly, it's never been a problem. I know what you're talking about. You know, we we have mail pickups. You know, mail trucks that actually come to our place. We're not we're not going to the post office every day. But in the early days, uh, back before we were really known by anyone, uh, my wife and I, when we were working out of our house, we would have to ship packages, and sometimes we'd have to drive them to the post office. Um, and I remember, you know, being asked that question: Do you have any liquids or hazardous, or you know, making sure there's no, you know, explosives or firecrackers or anything like that in there? So they ask you this barrage of questions, and I would always say, uh, yeah, I've got, you know, fountain, uh, fountain pen ink in there. And, and basically, I think they're just asking if there's any liquids that are hazardous or anything like that. I think maybe they may just want to know in case there's anything that's particularly fragile or, need, you know, shouldn't be frozen or anything like that. You know, here, when we ship stuff out, if it's cold and it's going to a cold location, we'll stick like these little do not freeze stickers on there. Uh, whether that actually does anything and anybody pays attention to it, we don't know, but we do our part uh, to try to help let them know about it. Uh, but I, I, you know, I've never heard, I've never heard anywhere of it being a problem shipping fountain pen ink or anything. You know, fountain pen inks are not, you know, hazardous materials or anything like that that's ever caused a problem. Even shipping internationally, it's never been a problem for us. So I think you're okay. It doesn't hurt to disclose it. Um, and, and every time that I remember being asked it at the post office, they never had a problem with it. <clears throat> Uh, Joey H on Facebook said, what's the best all-around ink that can be used in any fountain pen? Okay, so that's a very general question and very opinionated as well because there's a lot of different types of ink and you're asking about the best ink. Uh, you're going to ask 20 people and get probably 10 different answers. Um, so I will say that Noodler's Black is the most popular, just kind of all-around ink. You know, it's waterproof. You know, it flows well, just performs well in a variety of pens, variety of papers. I think Noodler's Black is just kind of the standard ink that a lot of people go to, very, very popular ink, and that would probably be my answer based on the information you've given me here. Uh, Alex N. in your email said, I own several fountain pens, Safari, 78G, Metro, Nib Creeper, Retro 51, and soon to be a Jinhao 126. Uh, all of which I enjoy. I want to be able to have them ready to use at a whim, but I've heard that some fountain pens, particularly the Safari and Nib Creeper, dry out easily, uh, dry out really fast in less than a week. How true is this? My 70AG sits for nearly a week between uses, less than three lines of text, and it seems to be okay. I've got my Nib Creeper feed set up just so, because you can adjust that one, and I'd rather not have to take it out to clean and scrub it out if possible, thus it's sitting on my desk uninked. Okay, so um, got a couple. Got a lot of things here. Uh, so I would say that uh, first off, how quickly a pen is going to dry out is going to depend really on three different factors. The first one is the pen itself. Really, it's just how well the cap seals onto the nib. Uh, it can vary quite a bit based on the pen's design. So you're asking specifically about the Safari and the Nib Creeper. And I will say those two pens tend to dry out a little more than others because they don't have, you know, a, a locking like inner seal in those caps. So that's one factor is the pen itself. Um, the next one is the environment in which the pen is being used and stored. Um, not just in terms of like, uh, you know, the, the actual geographic location where you are, which can definitely be a factor, but also the temperature, the relative humidity in the air is really the biggest factor. So like here, I'm in central Virginia. In the summertime, our humidity is like 80% every day. So pens don't dry out as fast. In the wintertime, it drops substantially because you've got heaters running and stuff like that. Uh, or in the summertime, if it's, if it's humid, but you're running air conditioners constantly that are drying out the air, that can also dry things out too. So the relative humidity can make pens dry out faster because, you know, fountain pen ink is mostly water. So if you think about how fast water will evaporate, if you have a pen that's not sealed that great and it's in a really dry environment, or if you're like, if you're in a desert environment, really arid, it's gonna dry out a whole lot faster than it will, you know, elsewhere. Um, and then the last factor is how often it's gonna be used, I think, um, or, or no, 
Yeah, how often it's going to be used is going to impact it too, but also the ink itself is going to play a part too. Um, some inks will be more prone to drying out quicker than others, um, really just depending on the ink chemistry. I can't give you like a specific answer. It's like this ink will be better, this one will take longer, um, but that's definitely a factor. So um, there's some things that you can do to kind of combat this. Um, storing the pens with the nib pointed down can help for sure. Um, there's a little trick that you can do. It may or may not work well in every pen, but you can actually cut up a small piece of sponge and stick it way down into your cap and wet it. And it acts like a little humidor inside your cap. Now, if you make the piece of sponge too big and it actually touches the nib, it'll like wick out a lot of the ink out of the pen. So you gotta be, you gotta play with it and fine tune it a little bit. But that's something you can play with. It's a neat little trick that I've heard that works well for some people. And I know the nib creeper, you can you can do it with that one. Uh, and then um, another thing you can do is store it in a Ziploc bag or some other kind of sealed container. You know, like maybe a cigar case or something like that um, that will kind of keep it uh, keep it sealed up. And the last thing is, you know, you're asking about that Noodler's Nib Creeper. You know, you can clean that pen without having to remove that nib. So as long as you're not like letting the nib completely dry up and get all encrusted, you should be okay. I would try to use, just use the pens regularly. You know, don't let them sit for more than a week without being used at all if you are in a really dry environment. Um, but you'll, you'll just kind of have to get a feel for it after using it for a while. Next question I have is from Benjamin B. And he sent an email saying, I have a Monteverde Invincia Color Fusion Black Stealth. Looking at the underside of the feed, there's a small circle with the number three molded into the plastic or whatever material. It's plastic. Uh, what does this three mean on the feed? Is it the inspector or machinist personal stamp or some sort of feed size thing going on or what? Well, I don't really know what their manufacturing process is for these feeds. Uh, I don't even know if Monteverdi makes those feeds. They probably are buying them from somebody else that focuses more on making feeds and nibs and stuff. I really don't know. That part is kind of a mystery to me. I'm, I'm a step removed from the manufacturing process for Monteverde. Um, but what I will say is I've seen a lot of those feeds and they all appear to be the same. Some have a number three on them, some have a number six, some don't have anything. I don't really know. I thought that myself when I saw it because I noticed details like that and I looked at all the different feeds and I was like, what is the difference? And there didn't appear to be anything. So there's probably some manufacturing designation somewhere that it means something, you know, way further up in the process, but it doesn't appear to mean anything to you or I as an end user. Uh, Bonita D on Facebook, you said, I recently ordered a Jin Hao X750, and while it seems to write well, I've noticed that the portion of the pen which houses the nib and feed and goes inside the grip section does not seem to be adhered to anything and simply comes loose. Is this normal or do I have a dud? Well, Bonita, that is not normal. Um, and I actually know exactly what you're talking about because I have a pen here that has the exact same thing going on. Um, so essentially what's happened is, you know, the, I guess the way that they manufacture these, um, you know, the nib and the feed are inside this housing, which is not unusual. This is very common for a lot of different pens. Uh, but apparently the way that Jin Hao assembles these is they use some kind of epoxy or glue or something on the nib housing and they just glue it in place inside the grip of the pen. So what's happened with your pen is the glue has come loose and your housing has come out of the pen. So that is a manufacturing defect. If you bought it from gouletpens.com, let us know, shoot an email to order it, orders at gouletpens.com and we'll help you out there. Uh, if you got it somewhere else, you know, contact wherever else you got it and see what they can do for you. Um, that is one advantage I will say about, you know, getting the pens from us. I know there's like places on eBay and stuff, you can get them direct from China that are cheaper than us. You know, it's a Chinese pen. There's a lot of people that are selling well, maybe not a lot of people, but there are some people that are selling these, especially direct, that are cheaper. Um, but I doubt that you're going to get great customer service if that happens. You know, it's an inexpensive pen. It's a sub $10 pen. This doesn't happen very often, but I, you know, you're not the first I've heard. It's happened a couple of times, and we'll, you know, we'll send you a new pen or give you a credit, whatever, whatever makes sense for you in your situation. But if you don't want to go through all that hassle, or if you got it from somewhere else and you can't get a replacement or whatever the situation is, you can fix this yourself. Um, probably the best thing to use would be a two-part epoxy. But, you know, also like a super glue would probably work as well, uh, too. Just a little bit of glue on here, you know, kind of spread it around. Make sure that thing's clean. Mine's actually got ink on it still. But uh, make sure that it's clean and then uh, put a little bit of glue just around here a little bit. You don't need a lot because if you put too much, when you try to slide it back together, you're going to get a mess of glue everywhere. But if you get a little bit of glue on here and then just put the thing back together, hold it in place, 
then you're going to be good to go. That's going to do everything because it's it's the really the body of the pen just kind of sits on the outside of this thing, and the converter fits onto the back of the feed here. So all of this is just kind of superficial and fits on there. It doesn't affect the function of the pen. So as long as you glue that thing back in place, and you're good to go again. All right. Carlos Q on Facebook said, why do some pens like the Preppy use an O-ring to convert them to an eyedropper, and others, like Edison pens and the Quaco Sport, do not need this O-ring? Uh, really, it all has to do with the thread tolerances, so the way that the pen threads together. The Preppy has got some slack in those threads. Now, technically, you don't need an O-ring to convert a Preppy to an eyedropper. You can just put silicone grease on the threads. But there's a lot of play in those threads, and the silicone grease alone, if you're working it back and forth, may have some ink that'll work its way through there. For me personally, you know, there's room to put that O-ring on there. It's just kind of an extra step to keep ink from leaking out of there. Because the thing is with eyedropper, if you don't have it sealed up well and ink leaks out of there, man, there's a lot of ink that can leak out of that pen. So it just doesn't hurt to put that extra step of the O-ring in there if the pen can easily accommodate it. Pens like the Coeco and the Edisons and stuff, they don't have as, 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 as good a way to accommodate an O-ring. Uh, and those threads are much tighter, especially the Edison. You know, uh, Brian Gray, you know, is kind of a friend of mine and, you know, I, I've talked to him about thread tolerances and stuff like that too. He's really precise about the way he makes those threads. And honestly, his threads are so tight that you barely need silicone grease on there. In fact, if you wanted to risk it, you could do without it. I don't really recommend it, but his thread tolerances are very tight, which is going to give him a very smooth feel when you close the, the, bot, the, the, the threads together. But the silicone grease is all you need on those types of pens. All right, Mate F on Facebook, you said, what are your thoughts on ink mixing or dilution in general? What brands or techniques uh, should you avoid? Um, so I've talked about ink mixing before. I don't do a whole lot of mixing, but I can give you some key points here. Um, so mixing within brands is usually okay. Um, the one kind of caveat is Noodlers has a vast selection of ink that has a pretty decent range of properties as well. So you want to be careful when you're mixing across certain properties. And, and really it's not that drastic either, but if you're mixing a bulletproof ink with a non-bulletproof ink, you're only going to have bulletproof properties for the portion that's bulletproof. So for, for example, if you're mixing bulletproof black with some kind of blue, okay, you're going to end up with kind of a blue black. And what's going to happen is if you wash away, if you get it wet, the blue part's going to wash away if it's not a bulletproof blue. The black part's going to stay. And it makes sense if you think about how you're mixing it like that. Um, the only one you really want to stay away from is mixing base state inks with non-base state inks. You can mix base states with each other, but the properties of those are very different. And you want to be careful with that. I'd also might be careful about some of the Noodler's eternal inks, like Luxury Blue and some of the UK and Russian colors, mixing those with non, you know, with conventional inks. Those you might get a little weird because the properties of those get kind of extreme. So be careful with that. Um, but there are some inks that are you know kind of good to mix or made to mix with each other. You know, Platinum Mix Free, that set was designed for mixing, they even put it in the name. Uh, Private Reserve, all their colors are neutral and, and made to be mixed with each other. Um, all the Noodler's conventional inks, you know, the non-extreme inks are all made to be mixed with each other. Um, I believe that Waterman and Schaefer and a lot of those pen companies' um, inks are, are good to go as well. So if you are going to get into any mixing, it's a lot of fun to experiment, but I would just say to do it in small quantities so you're not mixing whole bottles, and if it turns out to be a mess, you've ruined two bottles of ink, stick with small quantities. You, in, you know, do them in a sample vial or something. Um, and then whenever you mix something, let it set for a couple hours before you go throw it in a pen. Just in case there is some kind of weird reaction, because honestly, like mix a base state and a regular one. Just try it and see what happens. It turns into this like gel, like foamy mess. It's really cool and disgusting. Um, so, you know, don't mix something together not knowing what's going to happen and then put it immediately in a pen, because if you do get some kind of gelling or foaming or something crazy, you don't want that to happen in your pen. Um, I had two people ask a similar question here, both on Facebook, Sharon R. and Chad C. said, can you tell me of all the ink brands you carry that have waterproof inks? I know two or three, but I'm not sure that's all of them. My main concern is for addressed envelopes withstanding rain. Okay, so there's a, 
I can't tell you all of them because there's actually, on our on gulaypens.com, we have 69 different waterproof choices. Um, some of those are duplicated across different bottle sizes, like some of the Noodler's ones, but there's a lot of different water-resistant inks out there um, with varying degrees of waterproofness. It depends whether you define water resistance and proofness and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, they will all accomplish what you're trying to do uh, in terms of being able to make it through uh, a rainy, you know, transportation through the mail system. Uh, so the best thing to do is go to gulaypens.com, click on the ink ten, uh, tab in the menu, and go to shop all bottled ink. Click on that. And then you have a filter thing at the top that says find by ink property, and then select water resistant. It'll show you there's 69 different ones as of the recording of this video. Uh, most of them are gonna be Noodlers because Noodlers just has an affinity for uh, waterproof, water resistant inks. Uh, but there are some other choices there. So you can see just kind of at a glance what all the options are on one page there. So that's that's the best way to do it. Um, but you know, even if you don't have a waterproof ink, um, there are some little tricks you can use. I know there's some specific products. I can't remember the name of a product. There's some kind of like glue stick type thing that you can that you can buy to actually smear over top of your ink um, to kind of protect it as you send it out in the mail. But the coolest trick I've heard about is using a uh, candle, using a, just a regular like white candle. You can just rub the candle over top of your, your writing, whatever the ink is, and it'll put kind of a wax coating over top of it and kind of give it some ink resistance. So if you have a candle laying around and you don't feel like buying any new ink, just use whatever ink you want, rub a candle over it, and you should be good to go. Um, let's see here, pen, ink, paper, letter. Sorry, pen, paper, ink, letter on Facebook. Said, okay, so you have a daily carry pen case or a roll, a few pens, uh, but where do you carry the or but where do you carry the case? Squeeze it into your shirt pocket, throw it in a bag, keep it in your hand, etc. In other words, even inside a case, how careful are you with your pens? Uh, me personally, it's going to depend on what case you're using, like how well protected you feel it is within your case. Um, so that will vary a little bit. Me personally, what I end up doing, I'll show you what I've got. I, I you know, I, I use a laptop here, ex, you know, pretty much exclusively. Uh, I've got a laptop case that I keep with me with some, you know, it's like two pocketed thing. It's, it's nothing special. I got it at Target or whatever. It's not expensive, but you know, I might have a pen case like this. You know, I've got an Aston case 20 um, here. And so I've got a bunch of pens loaded up. And if I want to take this thing, I'll just slide it into one of my pockets. I've got the computer, got the pen case, you know, I'm good to go. But usually what I'll end up doing, unless I'm going to carry a big batch of pens like that, is I will carry um, just a couple of pens in these little Aston slips like this. So these are, you know, I've got like a Lamy 2000 in here, which that pen really doesn't even need a case because it's so durable. Um, the other one I've got here, um, I've got a Delta Fusion 82. Okay, so that's, you know, over a $200 pen. So this one I wouldn't want to just throw around, uh, but I do want to have it kind of at a grab. Um, so that one I will keep in a slip and just kind of keep it inside my case. So it really kind of depends on the value of the pen and how fragile I feel it is, where I'm going with it and stuff, but that's, that's kind of what I end up doing. Uh, Ray C on Facebook said, I see you and others use Rhodia dotted paper. What's the main purpose of the Rhodia dot paper as opposed to lined or blank? Okay, so the whole point of the dots, it, it only came out a couple of years. Uh, gosh, it would have been probably three, three and a half years ago now at this point. I don't remember. It was a while ago. Go back and look. It was I shot that back in my garage days, uh, back before I even had actual photography. I was using my video camera to shoot pictures back then. It's funny. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, basically I like the dot paper personally because a couple things. Well, first off, it's the it's the same five by five millimeter grid that you have with graph paper, okay? So um, that's kind of the point of it, um, except where you have the intersections on the graph, there's a dot there instead. So all the dots are five millimeters apart. So I like them because they're all consistent and standard. So when I'm doing an ink review or I'm writing with it and you're trying to get an idea of the thickness of a line, as a blogger or reviewer, it's nice for me because I can provide some consistency. Where it's a little harder to get that sense when you're using lined paper and impossible to get that sense when you're using blank paper. Um, I, that's why I like the dots is because it gives you a sense. You know, like the, nib, the nib nook tool that I have on the um, Goulet pens and actually the pen plaza tool too where I show the pen sizes, I end up using that five by five kind of grid as, uh, as a marker for, you know, the sizes of the pen and the size of writing and stuff for the, for the, for the tools that are built on the site. 
So that's really kind of cool. But purely as like me as an individual user, um, I like it because the dots are a little more subtle than these big lines. You know, in the blank, I do like using blank for when I do correspondence. What I'll do is I'll take a sheet of lined paper and put it behind blank paper. That way I get the lines when I'm writing it. But then when I actually tear it out and mail the mail it to somebody, they think I have like some amazing ability to write perfectly straight. But I'm kind of cheating. Uh, so that's a cool trick if you've never done that. But uh, yeah, I I like the dots because it gives it gives you you know some foundation, some grounding, a sense of where you're going on the page for when you're particularly when you're writing, you know, actual out. If you're drawing and stuff, blank paper is great, but when you're actually just like writing lines and to-do lists and stuff, it's really nice to have that guidance. Um, and also it's a five by five grid, so most of the ruling on the Rodia products are seven millimeters, the lined ruling. Um, and the five by five dots really is kind of nice because you can fit more stuff on a page. Now, if you're using a really fat nib, you may want to double it up and go to 10 millimeters, in which case you would actually be using more. But uh, it is kind of nice to have that option. So that's, that's why I think it's so popular. <clears throat> and the last question for this week, Stuart S. on Facebook. I enjoy writing with or collecting pens, but I'm also interested in them as a collectible investment. What should I be looking for in pens that will retain their value or increase in value over the long term? Which brands or types of fountain pens should I be investing in? Uh, so first off, let me say, this is purely my opinion. Please do not make any investment decisions based on what I'm gonna be saying here. This isn't even really my wheelhouse, okay? I'm not like some limited edition collector or anything like that that can predict you know, what's gonna be a good investment. So please, you know, just this is for entertainment purposes only. Do whatever you feel is best. Um, as far as investing in pens goes, you know, there's no guarantees. Uh, you don't know what's going to be good and what's not. I think some of it has to do with the quality of the pen, the reputation of the brand. Who knows what that's going to be in the future? Fountain pens in general. I don't know, man. Some of the companies get bought and sold and traded and stuff like that, and you know, it's really going to depend. And I would say that. Um, it's probably not going to be a big money maker for you. You know, if you really love pens and you want to buy expensive pens and not lose a lot of money or maybe just retain the value you put in it, that's probably the way to look at it. Don't look at it as, oh, I need to diversify my portfolio. I think I'll buy fountain pens and that will be a solid investment for me. Yeah, it's probably not going to be the case. And probably because you've got such a limited market, when you actually go to sell that pen and get back your investment, it's going to be hard to find the right buyer. And the amount of time that you're going to have to spend doing that and shipping it and verifying the quality and all this kind of stuff, it's probably not even going to be worth your time. That's just my opinion. You, there's probably a lot of other better financial tools. But if you really love pens and you want to kind of retain your investment and maybe justify to your spouse why you should be buying these expensive pens, you know, you could use the investment angle. Why not? So I would say, you know, whatever investment you get, you probably would be lucky just to keep up with inflation. But there's always going to be exceptions with that. You know, limited editions are probably going to be your best bet. You know, there's certain types of pens out there that you can kind of predict are going to do well. You know, things that are really artistic, really well themed, those are going to be generally expensive. However, let me have the caveat here that there has been a trend in the last five, 10 years maybe, that a lot of companies have been coming out with limited edition pens because they've been selling really well. So they've been charging kind of a premium just to be able to get these limited editions. So I would argue personally, I can't predict the future, but I would say a lot of these limited edition pens are probably not going to increase a whole lot in value just because you're already paying a lot for them in general. Now, there's always gonna be exceptions and I'm sure brand to brand it's gonna make a difference. And, uh, but that's just kind of my opinion. I, I personally don't like to push people down that road and I know I'm a retailer too and I probably stand to benefit from telling you that you should invest in pens. But you know, I'm really more of a fountain pen user. I think if you're gonna be using your pens, that's your investment. The investment is gonna be in your enjoyment, not just a, a money thing. Um, so, but uh, some things that do come to mind, me personally, like I know, uh, like Lamy every year comes out with, you know, uh, special edition safaris and all stars and stuff like that. Whenever those disappear, there's always an increase in value in those in a relatively short period of time. Like if you go right now and look at, you know, orange Lamy safaris or, you know, like maybe the mint green or the toffee all star, those you're gonna see are at least twice the price of a regular 
regularly available pen, maybe three times the price. And there's some really rare pens out there that I've seen, some older vintage stuff that is even more. Um, so, you know, I would say probably you're gonna be hard pressed to really get a great return on investment in terms of the time you're gonna spend and all that stuff, but it, you know, it can be kind of a fun aspect of the hobby if that's, if that's your particular interest in your angle. So hopefully that helps you out. Anyway, that's all the questions I got for this week. So it's uh, next week, I'm gonna be going to uh, a theme again. I'm gonna go to a brand theme. So I've done Lamy already, and I'm gonna go to Monteverde next week. Uh, I've got a lot of different Monteverde pens going on, and I just recently had the Regatta Sport and the Impressa that have come out. Also had uh, unfortunate news that the Monteverde Nighthawk has been discontinued. That was not a decision on my part. That was a decision made from the manufacturer. They had a real tough time with some quality stuff on their end, and they just were not able to produce the, the right quality control of the pens that they were looking to do that I was happy with. And unfortunately, they just decided to discontinue it. And I found out about that a couple days ago. So that's unfortunate. But there's a lot of cool stuff going on with Monteverde. They got a lot, of, a lot of things, you know, they've got ink line, they've got some stuff. So I figured there's probably a decent number of questions. And given that there's these two new pens, I'm gonna try to shoot a video on the Regatta Sport and the Impressa. I normally don't like to commit to shooting a video because my life is crazy and sometimes I'm not able to do what I intend to do. Uh, you know, but I will, I will make every effort possible to shoot a video on the Regatta Sport and the Impressa before next week. But even still, whatever questions you have about anything Monteverde, go ahead and ask me. You can do it on this YouTube video. You can do it on Inc. Nouveau. You can ask on Facebook. You can do it on Twitter with hashtag GoulayQA. Um, Wherever you want to do, you can email uh, GoulayQA at GoulayPens.com. Whatever way you want to contact me is great. And I will compile the questions and be back here next week. It'll be the 23rd Goulet Q&A that we've had, and it'll be February 28th. That's the plan. So I uh, hope you have a wonderful week, wonderful weekend here. Thanks for watching this somewhat extended version of the Goulet Q&A. Uh, I always appreciate your feedback, so please would love to hear what you have to say. Uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully I was able to help you out here. So anyway, have a great time and right on. <laughs>